Greetings and welcome to the House of Hammer. One that has so very, very many different rooms. I was toying with the idea of a walking tour of the place, but after getting lost several times, I figured I'm better off checking that the bar's well stocked instead. As with anywhere in this oddball filled country, it's situated very close to the chapel, where we coincidentally meet our first man of the cloth, the Rev himself, Simon Cherry. I'll give you a bit of a background on this before Smokey takes over. Meet Simon Cherry was premiered in November 1949 and would then go on general release in May 1950, nearly a year to the day since the cameras started rolling. The film was based on yet another popular radio series from 1946 called Meet the Rev, as well as seven segments for the TV series Kaleidoscope in 1948. Meet the Rev was the creation of the freelance researcher Gail Pedrick, and set in the then-present-day Wapping in London. The character of Simon Cherry, who was written as looking not a day over 40, had in the Second World War been Captain Simon Cherry, DSO, chaplain to the forces, and had many adventures, including escaping from a prison camp by knocking out two guards with the cricket bat that he always carried with him. Rather than dwelling on the still painfully recent conflict, the radio series sees him working at a settlement for dead-end kids where he functions as president, secretary, treasurer, and a good deal more. And all the time, ably assisted by his ex-Batman, Charlie. I've probably forgotten something crucial, so I'll hand you over to Smokey while I have a drink of think. I'm nobbling park trees in spirit level sanctuary. We will now hear today's sermon. Without giving away any spoilers about Meet Simon Cherry, the film we are covering on this particular episode, I think it's fair to point out that the main crux of the story is, through a certain set of circumstances, our eponymous hero stumbles across a crime and decides to try and solve it. Fair enough. Who wouldn't trust a travelling vicar to use their god-given detective skills to the solving of a potentially nefarious murder, huh? Well, you might think I'm being a little condescending and flippant when I say that. And that's because I am. But, as sceptical as I am regarding such matters, it is interesting to think where religion and crime come together in popular culture. Now, the lovely Ben has a segment coming up, covering some of the more famous and well-known of religious investigators and detectives, so I'm staying well clear of that topic. Let's just say the power of Christ compels me to. However, something that does need a smidgen of further examination is the respect afforded to religious figures when it comes to the movies and television. I will also make it clear, my friends, not to worry. I'm not going to go all spotlight on you, or even Christopher Plummer in Dragnet, for that matter. No, this is a general look at how vicars, priests, nuns, and various types of religious folks, normally connected to the church, are almost always welcome to the flock, pretty damned easily. Can I say damned when I'm talking about this? Hmm, God knows. A case in point, today's film. Kindly Vicar's car breaks down and is immediately taken in by a family with not a moment's hesitation. Granted, it's because Simon Cherry already has something of a reputation to the incumbents as being on the right side of the law but taken in immediately he is, nonetheless. But let's look at the flip side of that coin, shall we? How about the terrifying and sinister Harry Powell, played by Robert Mitchum in Charles Lawton's 1955 masterpiece, Knight of the Hunter? Another man of the cloth, seemingly welcomed with open arms into the bosom of the community he arrives in, all because of that white around his neck and his impressive way of delivering scripture. And that film carries a particularly nasty end to many of the townsfolk involved. But, as I said previously, taken in straight away as well. So, what is it that makes these people of religion seem so unthreatening in the first place? I mean, you could look at any British soap or drama stretching back decades for examples of this. Do you get the vision of a meek little vicar sat in a chintzy living room, sipping on a cup of tea and occasionally nibbling on his biscuit? Maybe trying to sell some raffle tickets for a church fete or accepting a donation for repairs to the church roof? I wouldn't blame you if you did. Or maybe you flashed a Dawn French, 
the lovely and bubbly Vicar of Dibley, again with a cup of tea and sat at the kitchen table, regaling her chum Alice with one of her terrible, terrible jokes. Either way, there are similarities to be had. I mean, it's all about the locale, isn't it? If you're a person of God, any God, it doesn't really matter which, and you enter a village or town full of devil worshippers, you probably wouldn't get the same kind of welcome now, would you? I guess it all comes down to this. In times gone by, your local vicar or priest, alongside, say, visual representations of the Bobby on the Beat, as we witnessed in PC49 not too long ago, represents safety, knowledge, and sage advice. But most importantly, they aren't seen as any kind of threat. And if they are surreptitiously hiding any would-be psychotic or violent tendencies, it's normally too late by then anyway. Although, I suppose an upside there is, you've got someone on hand to perform the last rites and put the coins on your eyes. So, for every Hugh Moxie in Simon Cherry, you get a Christopher Lee in To the Devil a Daughter. Or, for every Max von Sydow in The Exorcist, you get a kinky Paul Bettany in The Da Vinci Code. It's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? I guess the moral of the story is this. If you find yourself in a situation such as this, you'd better get down on your knees and pray that you get Simon Cherry in your life. And not a fake priest that may smash your hand just because you beat him at bowling. Words for us all to live by. Amen. As Smokey said, Cherry is waylaid by bad weather to a very windswept and remote country house while on his way to his holiday, where he ends up investigating the death of a young woman. The question is, was it suicide, murder, euthanasia, or natural causes? Joining us to dip a bit further into the film are our good friends Adam Roach and Ben Taylorson, who we've foolishly left to head up the proceedings, and you'll find out why in a while. So, meet Simon Cherry, lads. Um, and the protagonist here is a... We, we've got a, a man of the cloth. We've got a, a, a sort of... A, never really exactly explained what his role with the church is, other than the fact that he's he's obviously a, a vicar or similar. What I would say is, in, in the plot, it's very sparsely referenced, but he, he does... As you've alluded to in your in your your segment already, Smokey, he has that aura of respect, even though you know, frankly, he's just a bit of a nosy get. <laughs> yeah, he is a little bit. I mean, but it, it is made clear fairly early on that yes, he, he as you say, man of the cloth, but that he previously worked in uh, in a prison. He was a padre there, and that he was also. But then he's also been uh, involved with the police as well. <laughs> involved in, as in helping. I mean, I've been. To, uh, he hasn't done anything <laughs> dodgy. He's not one of them priests. Um, but he. Um, well, he does hang around the boys' gym. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so eleven seconds that took. <laughs> that's <Rather>. it. <laughs> but he does. But it also becomes clear that um, he has a reputation for assisting the police in their inquiries, and he actually is quite well known as well, which we'll come back to in just a bit. He actually being religious is very firmly on the back burner through the entire film. His relationship, if you will, with God never once comes up, which is quite surprising when he is what he is no it, it they do firmly sort of go on the fact that he's a good guy and mm. and if we return to the boys club for a second i do enjoy the fact it was a boys club where your your choice of activity was either boxing mm-hmm. pommel horse yeah. or watching boxing or pommel horse <laughs> and there was, there was nothing else to do apart from those two things yeah or punching out the trainer that was fun the whole the whole bar triangle i mean i have actually heard the original radio series that this is based on. I don't own it, actually, but I remember Meet the Rev. I remember listening to that whole series a couple of years ago. And it's really good. It's one of those... Um, it's very boys' own... Not boys' own the band. Boys' own... <laughs> <laughs> We've got some Irish pop music going. <laughs> don't love me for fun, girl. <laughs> Let me be the one, girl. <laughs> no one loves reason be for fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't get up of the chair from the chair on, on a key change. It's only words. But, um, the the mysteries were really solid. <laughs> um, the mysteries were really solid, and I quite enjoyed it. And I remember uh, when I first when I watched this, I was like, "Oh, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this." And then I realised it was Meet the Rev, the movie, um, Meet Simon Cherry. I think the whole um, priest angle doesn't come into it much because, um, I mean, even with people like Father Brown, who was like Chesterton's detective, it's more a device that allows him 
instant access to literally everyone he meets, which mm. is which is just a time saver if you're an author because everyone was respectful of the priesthood and you know mm. God in in those days. So he could basically knock on a door and they'd invite him in, and suddenly he'd be in a mystery. Or he could basically just walk around with the police and they wouldn't tell him to f off because you know he's a man of the cloth. So I think in that way the device is very well used. But as you say, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't get preachy on anyone. Mm. He doesn't really get sort of holier than thou or anything like that. He doesn't quote scripture at them. It's, uh, no, it's, it's quite refreshing. Mm. In, in that respect because uh, you know, they have a tendency to either be uh, idiots or um, holier than now and um, Simon Cherry's not really like that at all he's quite cool I think. well the way that he's actually uh, portrayed as well as being a uh, kind of caring sharing kind of guy you know he's more sort of hands on padre rather than you know a spiritual leader um, because there's a part just at the beginning really where they're in the gym and they're talking about one of the uh, kids you know, and the fact that he's had to take uh, the information that this kid's dad is on death's, uh, death row, mm. practically, you know, he's, he's about to be hung in the morning, hanged in the morning. And, you know, he's, he's got to actually take that on the chin and talk this kid through it. And um, he's more of a community kind of guy, really. Yeah, definitely. More of a community service kind of influence. Very much so. I think we should give a bit of context there. So it does, I mean, it's it's kind of one of those things. It's like a community outreach type thing, isn't it, that he's involved with? Yeah. It's like a, like a kind mm. of youth hostel that he's helping wayward kids to sort of better themselves, if you will. I mean, the the, the main one we, we meet is Bert, who who has been in trouble for, for knocking out a policeman, which I thought was rather <laughs> rather daring of the, of the young chap. I must admit, I, I've watched this twice i think you guys have as well uh, recently and um yep. on the first watch i was actually a little disappointed that we left his london life as quickly as we did on the as i say on the first watch it was it was the it was the more interesting aspect i thought it was the you know trying to help these these kids and and, mm. and put them on the right path and then to suddenly abandon it five ten minutes in for a bit of a quiet jaunt in the country with his sister it seemed like a bit of a missed opportunity thankfully the, the on the second viewing it it made a lot more sense and i was sort of like oh okay i see where they're going with this but um, yeah but um but yeah it was it was a nice it was a nice setup because he was obviously he was a good man but he was also troubled because his mate charlie was sort of very concerned about him it seemed like you know he needed to get away he needed to recharge his battery so so to speak yeah in the I can say in the original radio series most of the adventures take place in and around his community work in in london so i think basically at the I, i'm i'm actually very sorry they didn't make more adventures with i'm gonna put my cards on the table straight away and say i really really like this film uh yeah i think they were setting it up and it's a shame like you say they didn't start with one of those stories but mm. i do think it was still cool that they didn't just have him arriving in a car at this country house having broken down and start the story that way you get that little five minute vignette at the beginning of him doing his community work and having the bit of banter about the car and being given the car it does make you think they're gonna have some adventure in in the city but i think if you look at it in more broad context it looks like they were planning three or four of these but perhaps it wasn't a hit it could have been so they didn't bother but i like the fact that it begins that way in the city because it mm. shows his friends and the regulars and the kids mm. and the guy that gives him the car and he, you know even says right i'm off home now to see them and i'll tell charlie about he, he makes some comment at the end i can't quite remember exactly what he says but he's like you know my friend charlie or something like that and he says what did you say oh nothing i'll tell him when i get home and it's just <laughs> I, I, it's almost like um kind of see the blueprints of a series oh, oh you mean like it, the, that end, the end of the film is kind of setting up for a sequel yeah like um you know uh, he'll be pleased to hear oh god remember what he says now something about the car isn't it and yes yeah that's right, charlie yeah. again he's going to go back um yeah I, I can totally see the continuing adventures of simon jerry mm. them him and charlie investigating some murder in a tenement or something yeah <laughs> well sp speaking of the car i mean it's it's perhaps uh, um um about time that we just segued slightly out of this conversation into a little <laughs> piece that our friend kev has done because um, the car is, is a little bit chitty chitty bang bang like needs it all there crank handle to get it going and Kev has done a little bit on the uh, history of the crank handle <laughs> if there's one thing we enjoy doing it's these little bits of history that sometimes have a tenuous connection to the film and after a couple of painful minutes for Charlie the car is eventually started and the reverend is off leaving Charlie and the crank handle behind this got me thinking what if the car breaks down how does the Rev get the car going again? Why did cars have crank handles at all? As driving one is something I have someone else do, 
I realised how little I knew, so here we are. Crank handles. It appears these things were there because early jalopies didn't have ignition keys, or indeed an ignition. And let's face it, it didn't matter if some hoodlum attempted to make off with your beloved hardtop, you could easily catch up with the bounder on foot. In 1908, following the death of a friend from crank-starting complications, Henry Leland declared, There'll be no more crank-related injuries! If he could help it. A helpful chap called Charles Kettering got right on it, and by 1911 patented the electric self-starter. Fatalities? Yep, there were quite a few among the thousands of injuries stretching from sprained wrists to dislocated shoulders and concussion. Starting a horseless carriage wasn't for the faint-hearted. The engine could kick back, causing sudden reverse rotation of the crank handle, and operators were advised to cup their fingers and thumb under the crank and pull up. But it felt natural to simply grasp the crank handle. That's where the problems would start before the motor. Over the years, larger and larger engines made it even more physically demanding and dangerous. With this in mind, you'd think the hand crank would become a thing of the past as soon as possible. But no, not so. It was almost gone by the turn of the 50s in the United States, but pretty much a fixture in Britain until the 70s because we still don't trust cars on a cold day. Ladders and other communist block cars featured crank starting as late as the 1980s, but not to be outdone, the French continued for a lot longer with the anachronistic little Citroen 2CV, which included a hand crank handle for backup starting until it finally ceased production in 1990. That's nearly 80 years later. Needless to say, Hives, our driver, has nixed the idea of getting a 2CV. So the vague plot is that the hero, well, hero, in inverted commas, Simon Cherry, leaves a, a sort of urban London to the middle-class uh, suburb, coastal areas of, of, of wherever, where his, uh, his family lives, because uh, he needs a bit of downtime. And uh, his car breaks down, who'd have thunk it? Mm. And uh, he um, ends up in a, in a stately home, uh, with another weird butler, <laughs> which is definitely hey! another uh, another point for the uh, the, the uh, bingo card of, of uh, House of Hammer. Yeah, he uh, he sort of makes himself at home, and there's obvious there's a, there's a relationship between several of the of the siblings um, in the house and, and siblings and cousins. It is, and there's there's one uh, of them in particular who's an invalid. Their, their words, not mine. And Simon Cherry sort of uh, makes it his his duty to to investigate what's going on. And a death occurs, and and he's afforded that respect that we mentioned earlier, and, and apparently is is known somehow bizarrely, uh, and that's not for the first time as well in Hammer's uh, early uh, films that he's supposed to be known, which I think is a reflection. It's meant to reflect on the audience because they know the character, mm. so we're meant to think that mm. everyone knows him without actually alluding to the original radio series. But Smokes, what did you think of of Hugh Moxie as 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 the Reverend uh, Simon Cherry? Do you know what? I actually really liked him. I thought he brought a warmth to the character that I thought was 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 refreshing. Um, he was everything that Doctor Morell could have been and wasn't. Whereas yeah. you know, polar opposite. It, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, I remember Adam mentioning about you know how vastly different Doctor Morell was uh, between the radio and the film. I'm guessing that's not really the case here, Adam. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but there was just something. There was just something about um, Hugh Moxie's performance that I really liked. He, he, he was he was understated when he needed to be. He was serious when he needed to be, and he was absolutely very charming when he needed to be as well. And I, yeah, I loved his performance. I think it was one of the better performances of the film. Uh, certainly of well, let me put it this way: certainly of the male cast. I think he was hmm. the best performer that there was. Although, actually, speaking of the male cast, we also have been uh, reunited with uh, John Bailey, who was the villainy b- from Celia. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so yeah, got Mr. To, Eyebrows. That's it, Mr. Eyebrows. Yeah, so we, we've hmm. been reunited with him again. But uh, Adam, am I right? Is is uh, his portrayal of uh, the Rev similar? Yeah. So um, the Rev was a very warm, very avuncular character, and um, Simon Sherry. Uh, Hugh Moxie, sorry, nails it. 
good. And I think I think it's important because you wouldn't open your home or your heart to someone who rubbed you up the wrong way. And I think he doesn't ever come across as overbearing or over familiar. As Ben said, the whole mystery kicks off with him arriving, having broken his car broken down and he just comes into the house and instantly you get the sense that something's wrong and it turns out you know there's an invalid in the top room and there's some kind of secret that's affecting everyone and then suddenly a death occurs like ben says and because simon cherry is in the house he's able to approach each character with an introduction to how can i help you how uh, can i help you get over the pain that you might be feeling from this death but very cleverly manages to extricate their feelings about what's been going on or the person that's died Mm -hmm. so it's a great device really because he's able to move around the house and speak to all the characters and you know no one goes please go away because he's a man of god so well he's not a threat is he he's he's as i say he's warmth he's not a threat he's a he's a friend instantly to them well most of them a couple of a bit spiky towards him but i I just thought it it worked yeah he he's brilliant because Mm. he manages to convey that i would i really like to help you and i empathize with how you're feeling yep why are you feeling like this? Why do you feel the way about that person? And their secrets just spill out to him. Um, I do think, however, that uh, he, he has been brought to us um, possibly by the uh, Pipe Smokers Council of Great Britain because he does <laughs> apparently rely heavily on his pipe to solve all mysteries to the point where the exact line, and I've written it verbatim, is, I wouldn't have gotten to the truth of it all if I hadn't had to go to get my tobacco, which I'd left downstairs. <laughs> and he's, he's literally inches away from saying, and I solved it all thanks to the smooth, invigorating pipe I was enjoying at the time. <laughs> <laughs> With no throat scratch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I would go as far as to say we've had tons of great female leads. Mm. I'm struggling to call to mind of an appealing, uh, charming male lead from the Hammer films we've seen. So uh, Paul Robeson's great, but you know he's very much a different kind of lead. You don't get many males in the Hammer films we've seen so far. Wandering around, talking to people, just doing small things, not belting out songs. Yeah, I I, I mean, even Dick Dick Barton was flawed, wasn't he? So well, you know, as well, Dick Barton was. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Ford is good <laughs> PC <word>. 18. <laughs> PC forty nine was played by two different guys. You yeah, <laughs> but you know, yeah. Hugh Moxie as Simon Cherry. I, I think he's probably my favourite Hammer lead so far. I really uh, like him. Uh, favourite male lead? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, favourite male lead. Sorry, that's what I meant. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Kev, I agree. Kev? Yeah, we've also got a solid um, butler again in this <laughs> because Young in this. <laughs> is fantastic. I'm He's obsessed amazing. with butlers now. It's all because I've started watching these Hammer films. And I just, I just, <laughs> I wondered, I just um, like the term solid butler. I just think solid, that's good. Solid we've butler, got, we've yeah. got some solid butler this week, lads. And, and also, there's a lot of good... The, the, the ironically named Young as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. It must have worked for the first 150 years of his life. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's as bad as Slim and Chubby in the last um, well, yeah. couple of uh, movies we've had, yeah. <laughs> where it's skinny and chubby. Something um, like that. But yes, yeah. Young, who, to me, has a brilliant performance, and it's weird because you don't really notice it until you watch it again, and you watch how layered his performance is, and obviously you know what he's actually thinking by the time you're watching it again. And it's fantastic to watch. It's a, a really understated and really clever performance. One thing I would say about all of the characters in this, they're all necessary. And there are no yeah. red no red herrings in this, which I really like. Because I do yeah. spend a lot of time watching these old house, 1920s, genteel murder mysteries. I love them. But I do find myself mm. being lost sometimes with that character. If the characters look similar, or their motivations are kind of similar, or they're doing something I don't really care about. You kind of get lost in red herrings and side plots and things. I will say, if you're one of those people whose brain just can't compute all the different plots of an Agatha Christie novel, when the main thread was what you were interested in. You didn't care about who's having an affair with who and why this person has dropped a sock somewhere. Meet Simon Cherry is one of these very refined, very distilled stories that focuses purely on the murder mystery. And every character in there is important to the plot and has a role in what has happened and why it's happened. And the whole thing's 62 minutes. It's so, like, there's, like, clockwork. You get to the end and you're like, wow, that's really clever. And then it has more surprises for you. I'm, I'm a big fan of this film. I'm a very big fan. I, I watched this some months ago when I was trying to get ahead on the 
the Hammer films, and I remember saying to you guys, "This is this is one to watch." I'm I'm, I'm very yeah. very impressed mm. with this as a murder mystery. I think it's mm. really it really works. I mean, I can see why they took it away from the Dockland, you know, because obviously they wanted to take it back to the mansion because obviously it's where they can do it on the cheap. Obviously, they're not going to be able to do a lot of outside broadcast uh, recording. You know, location. there's not a lot of location stuff on this, so you can see why they've actually gone back to the old dark house pretty much straight away yeah this mm-hmm. reminded me a little bit of uh, of uh, of celia and something that uh, adam mentioned is that what's what's really clever is this is as soon as simon cherry comes into the house unbeknownst to you as the viewer straight away the film is giving you a tour of the house it's letting mm. you learn that it's letting you yeah. learn the geography of it so you're mm-hmm. you're you're standing in this gorgeous gigantic foyer finding where the staircase is finding where all the doors lead to and into the the the, into the drawing room and then also then you have the stairs to where each of the bedrooms is and all that and i thought that was incredibly clever um i did like uh uh, young the the butler he is um interrupted taking up um someone's uh, glass of milk to their room the doorbell rings he looks at the door and he just goes nah and he carries on up the stairs until the doorbell (laughs) rings again and then he turns around and goes and answers the the door he's just all like no 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 mate you're a butler go and answer the door <laughs> but, yeah he decided to, to to do a bit of a, a double take on that one as adam said it was good to you you meet what how many four or five characters in a very short space of time now now that we're inside the house but it didn't feel forced you just happened to be meeting members of a family and um yeah and it mm. was it, it was a real nice way of just being introduced to every every member who was in the house in in quick succession Intrinsic to the plot in this film, and we've seen this before in a couple of other Hammer films, uh, is the sort of the prospect of engagement, engagement in the 1940s, and what apparently hasn't changed much in the previous 150 years. So engagement, and I mean between a sort of a man and a woman, appears to be an incredibly uh, odd mix of formal and informal. Um, and I mean, you, you, uh, Adam, and. Uh, Smoke, you've seen lots of classic cinema. Kev, you'll probably remember from your actual life. What in, in those um, in that particular time period is um, you know is it is it true to say that it that it's very difficult to connect to how that kind of worked now? Because I'm just I just find it all very very odd. Sick burn. <laughs> Oh, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> Poor old Kev. No, it didn't. I've been storing it up all <laughs> he night. He did say he was going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You wait till I introduce you, you f***er. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember what the question was. It's, oh, it's, oh, just, oh, it's just this concept of, oh, I'm formally engaged to Lord blah, 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 but, but, I've, but, I've, but I've been with you uh, having intimate fishing sessions for three months. It's like, how does any of that work? I just don't understand. <laughs> yes, Smokey, take and run with this is the term intimate fishing sessions. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that Foster's coming out of your nose? <laughs> <laughs> It was it's coming out of his ears. It was the intimate fishing session. Oh. Is Miss Foster's the name of your butler? <laughs> <laughs> with, with two T's. He's a solid butler. He's a solid butler. <laughs> he has to be the pounding. No, never mind. Moving on. <laughs> yes, the, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, the, the, the thing is, in old the, in old movies, um, they tend to meet someone and go, "You look nice, let's get married." And they go, "Okay." Yeah. Yeah. So mm. I've, I've always found that a bit like Oosh. there's a there's a radio play actually um, called Dime a Dance, and it stars Lucille Ball, and it always blows my mind. There's a p- detective, and he's protecting her all the way through, and at the end, like he terrifies, he bl- uses her as bait to catch a killer, and he catches the killer, and he almost kills her in the process. And and um, as she's weeping Oops. against his shoulder from the shock of, you know, the, the horror of what's happened, he says, shut up, stop crying. No wife of mine's going to, like, cry all over someone's lapel. And she wow. says, marry you. And she goes, yes, now fucking wipe your eyes. Get her eyes go to the church kind of thing. And she goes, okay. And I thought, so, like, was it that easy to get married? Give me a couple of neat pointers. Yeah. I put them together with four butterflies so I could scare the daylights out of you. Well, you did, too. I ought to ring your... Now, calm down. No wife of mine is going to have a red-headed temper. Wife of yours. 
You'll do anything to learn how to dance, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks that way. So, look, at River Patrol, they had no interest yes. in each other at all. And he, he, it, they would get married at the end. It seems to me, like many people in those days, or from the films I've seen, just said, let's get married, and if it does, <laughs> let's see if it works. <laughs> Which yeah. is a really crazy thing to do, especially because divorce wasn't was so expensive. So basically, they would just go, "You look nice, I'll marry you," and they would go, "Oh, okay." I was actually just waiting in the queue for some meat or something. But yeah, sure, let's go and get married. Is that you? And then they go and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> then they get, meet Simon Cherry. Then they go and get married. And they live in a house, and um, you know, ended up being miserable for seventy five years. <laughs> yeah, Kev, you were there at the time. How was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, bizarrely, uh, we talked about this on Dead of Night, if you remember, because there's the uh, mirror story with Googie Withers, and that seems like a really strange one because you've got these two people that seem to not even know each other at all, and then it's like, yes, I'm going to get married on Tuesday. There you go. Yeah, I, I, yeah, marriage, marriage and engagements in a. Ye olde Britain always seemed a little bit like rushed to me. Speaking of the engagements, um, Zena Marshall, who's uh, Lisa in this. Now, we were talking about the cast and what have you, and a lot of these people don't appear in anything other than maybe the odd bit of TV or the ITC thing or stuff. But Lisa Marshall, uh, well, Zena Marshall, sorry, is Lisa. Uh, she's got a hell of a career. She's actually the first Bond girl. She's in Doctor No, and she's the one that actually brings uh, Sean Connery over to her place and he ends up throwing uh, a heater into the bath. That's her. Huh. Zena Marshall. Oh, she's the heater. And, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so hot. I mean, so she's the first the first woman to be bo- bedded by Bond. And wow. then by she ben. has a pretty... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> bothered by bend <laughs> that's what it's, happens in my film I, mean, I was going to say you said that before <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a shame that she ended up um, starring in the Terranauts for Amicus because that actually ruined her completely and she never acted after that oh Oh, well, you, you you could have left that out and left it on a happy note but never mind but, um, but did anyone else have that <clears throat> the, uh, so Apart from Simon Cherry, the, uh, and I suppose Young, the butler as well, the, the other two main male characters are, are, are not the most likable of people, really. No, I totally agree with that. Hmm. Yeah, it depends, so- it, depends, it depends how you interpret the plot. I mean, I, I'm not going to give you any spoilers because no. we, you know, that, that's not what we do, but I, 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 I wouldn't say that the other male characters aren't necessarily, uh, are necessarily unlikable. The the plot it, it this feeds into a large question about how the plot sort of unfolds, and I think this film's really clever. And the, 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 you know we we we've said before with some of these films that that we've uh, talked about so far that we've got to the sort of the second half of the film and we're only thirty minutes in and you're thinking oh my god how much you know, please end. <laughs> um, but with this the way in which the the plot uh, unfolds and the way in which the story is told it really it really really sort of captured me. Um, I, I really enjoyed the fact that the, the, the last sort of twenty five minutes is is the same the same story from two entirely different angles, um, and um, that 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 allows you as a viewer to take sides in whichever direction you would like to, um, and it's very clever. and And I would say that yeah. they're almost all, bar one, of the characters you could have empathy, sympathy for, however you want to put it. Um, Adam, what do you think? Um, I was going to say exactly the same thing. Um, it's just something I wanted to go back to that Smokey said quickly about the geography of the house. Mm. There's a very important part of the solution, should we say resolution, that comes about through knowing where certain bells are in the house. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but when he says that, and he says there's one on the stairs, and Young, the butler, later on in the film, says there's one on the stairs, one in the pantry, and one in the room. I instantly knew where they were because, as you say, Smokey, the film did an incredibly good job of touring around the house without letting you know you were being toured around the house. Then, about halfway through, as Ben said, there's a flashback, basically, that tells you why a certain character might have killed a certain character. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it for you. And you you watch it and you go, oh, God, I can see why they did it. Mm -hmm. And then, all of a sudden... As Ben says, you hear that character's uh, version of events, and it's like Rashomon. It's very strange. It's Mm. like you get the same story from a different character, and you see all the nuances and differences, and you go, oh, my God, this has just thrown everything into 
complete disarray. Then <laughs> the solution comes, and then you get a twist on the solution. And I think for a 62-minute film that doesn't even... You don't even get to the house till about 10 minutes into the film. Yeah. That's incredibly tight plotting. Very inventive storytelling. I mean, it even flashes back at the end while the resolution's coming out and the solution's being given to you. You even uh, get a flashback of the scene where Simon Cherry enters the house. And everything you saw at the beginning with the butler and the mirror and the glass of milk and everything, the whole thing takes on this whole different meaning. Yep. And then you see, then you notice little details that were staggeringly obvious all the way through. Like, I'm not going to mm -hmm. spoil it, but the wind blowing a curtain in a mm -hmm. room. Yep. Um, the bells ringing as he's walking up the stairs and you wonder who's ringing. And I mean, all of those things sound like, you know, oh God, it's just a standard murder mystery trope crap. But they're all incredibly important given their own importance. Mm. For a, for a 62-minute film, this is a blinding little murder mystery. Yeah, uh, well, all apart from the logic bomb that is, if you've got a bell and you're ringing it for a servant, where in the house would you make sure there was a bell? Mm -hmm. It would surely be in the kitchen or the servants' quarters, surely. So why is it in this house <laughs> you've got a bell in every sodding room except the servants' quarters? Young quite happily can sleep all night and never be bothered by anybody ringing for any service whatsoever. Young can do where he wants. Yeah, I think, I think that point of not having a bell in the servants' quarters is... That they are supposed is, to be on it, duty and walking yes. around the house all day when they get to the servants' quarters and they're on duty. Seven. They're not to be. <laughs> <laughs> they're allowed to sleep for six hours. <laughs> what it's like in Don. <laughs> also, <laughs> also, though, Adam, you know about the uh, the mirror shots. There's a mirror shot where, at, at the opening, and you see it from two <laughs> angles. You see it yes, replayed, yeah. and it's interesting because you can see that they've actually had to perform it twice. Mm. Every actor has to do that scene twice in reverse. Yeah. So it's just a nice touch yeah, when you, you watch it again and realise and you pick it up and you go, hang on, yeah. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up now because I think we're getting to the point where um, we, we can't really say much more without edging into spoiler territory. And I think we've covered um, the plot thus far. So as is my, my way now, I'm going to um, leave you with a... Uh, the opportunity to um, give a rating, but also um, I'm going to prompt you for something. In this this particular um, instance, I'm going to prompt you for a question. So I want you to talk a little bit, very briefly, about what you thought of the film, what you'd rate it, and I want you to end on a question about the film itself. Um, so I'm going to go to Adam first. Can you tell us a bit about what you think about the film? Give us a rating and then maybe a little question about the film. I've seen the film twice. I was utterly impressed by it both times. Happily watch it again. It's a very smart, very efficient. We say efficient quite a lot for these films because they're short. But in this case, the efficiency means it tells an incredibly clever story in the the minutes that it needs to be told. It, there's not an ounce of fat on this film at all, and there's no character in it that isn't needed. It just tells a story that's completely pure all the way through. It's very clever. And the end has a beautiful twist. Not just that, it has a twist on the twist. So um, I'm very, very impressed with this film, and I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10, because I would say this is one of my favourites so far. Right, no, it probably is my favourite so far, and um, one of my favourite British films from this period, having seen it. Twice. So, um, But if I had to end on a question, I'm going to say, why on earth would Charlie give Reverend Simon Cherry a car? That had a <laughs> Smokey? Um, okay, uh, same as Adam. I watched this twice, and I will be perfectly honest, the first time I watched it, I gave it such a average score. I was, I was incredibly disappointed with it. I thought it was... Um, I, I gave a terrible analogy during the production meeting that Adam didn't attend, and uh, and, and Ben called me out on it straight away because I compared it to a ski slope. And it's not a ski slope, it's a roller coaster. And so I'm going to change that now. <laughs> so it starts off high. It starts off with this great bit in London, and then it comes down and it goes a bit dull, and then it goes up again, and then it comes down and goes a bit dull. And that was my first viewing. But the second viewing, which I did, it just it kept going up. It does actually get better and better. Um, I'm so glad I watched it a second time. If I hadn't, this would have been a very different uh, evaluation, very different podcast. Um, the All the performances are good. 
I I love them all. I do. I I know. I get where you're coming from, Ben. But I do find it hard to have sympathy for a couple of the characters because they're just unlikable in my eyes. So I didn't really care. Yeah, well, v, up the V's to you as well, my friend. But um, but uh, it's very clever, and I don't think it knows how clever it is. I th- I think it's it's underwhelming. Uh, it it's underwhelmed itself in its clever <laughs> cleverness. And, um, yeah, it, it, it took me by surprise. There is one little thing that I would like to add before I give my rating is my favorite bit of the entire film is that during the film, there is a wedding scene and the happy couple, well, in inverted commas, the happy couple are coming, cascading down the stairs. They're just, you know, genteely walking down. And obviously the director has said, right guys, to the extras, just gently throw rice at them as you do at a wedding. <laughs> And one bloke, a little <laughs> tiny balding bloke, has taken that to mean he needs to lodge a handful of rice in their face as hard as possible for as long <laughs> as possible. He does it from when they get to the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs. And how they didn't, someone didn't lose an eye, I will never know. <laughs> it's the most glorious bit of extra acting I have ever, ever seen. And I, I I know I told you guys about it off mic, but if you haven't noticed it, go back and watch it. It's an absolute delight because I just I was just giggling all the way through. <laughs> I'm not going to go as mad as Adam. I, I'm going to put this on a par with uh, with um, last episode's um, uh, uh, film. Uh, it's it's a seven for me. It's it's solid, but it's just a little <laughs> underwhelming. Uh, but uh, but I did enjoy it. I thought it was a great film. But uh, yeah, not quite a nine point five, I'm afraid. And I'm ended on a question, which is, what would uh, Simon Cherry tell Charlie when he got back to London? Not why did that bald guy lob rice in the couple's face? No, no, I I know why he wanted to do it. He wanted to be noticed. That's fine. Some people just want to see the world burn, Ben. (laughs) (laughs) Some people just want to see the bride's eyes full of rice. That little bald man? That little bald man? Bane. There we go. (laughs) Kev? With a Nerf gun. Um, For me, yes. uh, This is a great film. Um, I just love the way that it's... uh, Well, we've talked, there is a dead body. And the way that we get our dead body to become a dead body is really ingenious and it really reminds me of um, David Renwick's writing style yes. where you nice. where he nice. writes it in backwards mm. he, he he gets this position like in One Foot in the Grave and um, Jonathan Creek and writes backwards to the mm. beginning of the episode that's a great and shout that Sorry, looks Jonathan like Creek this is, is yeah yes yeah. yes yeah and it feels like this is written in exactly the same way because it's so ingenious mm. and then you see the clues afterwards and you think, oh my God, it was there as well. You know, you mm. can actually see it all working. All the pit bits are there. It's all mm. dropping into spot. So yeah, um, it's a brilliant film. Um, for my, I would say my rating is not going to be as generous as Adam's because... I'm not yeah. expecting anyone to be as generous as me, I have to say. <laughs> but, but having seen so many of these well, films from this period, it's such a delight to see one so clever. That's yeah, right. what yeah, I yeah. go, wow, great, um, just have all the points. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, don't listen to him. <laughs> no, I've already, I've already marked this on my letterbox, didn't it? It's um, nine, nine out of ten. Uh, it's a, it's a brilliant film, um, and it looks really good, and it sounds good. That wind howling all the way through yeah. that night, the first night. Oh God, that's very reminiscent of the old Dark House, the um, mm. Universal Monsters film, um, in, in a similar kind of setting as well. But yeah, my question would be: Do you reckon the Harling family moved to Hurling Cove because it was as close as they could get to their own name? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, Kev. That's a cracking question. Looks good, sounds good. <laughs> Perfect segue to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to be slightly contrary here. I'm going to play the Kev. Um, hey! <laughs> I, I don't think I enjoyed this as much as you lot did. Um, it was all right. Uh, it was all right. It was all right. Car chases were rubbish. <laughs> yeah, he needed more. Needed more car chases. No, it was. I. I. I it's. It's <laughs> very well made, but it. But it didn't grip me. True. Um, that wasn't a pop. It. I enjoyed objectively, the the the, the plot, and um and yeah, I agree that it it's it's nicely written backwards. The final twist, not necessarily massively on board with that, um and uh, I thought there was an awful lot of plodding around. 
by our, our protagonist. I thought it's a, and now I went to see the butler. Hmm, but you've already spoken to the butler three times before. I've been watching this film for 55 minutes. Um, you know, so there's a little <laughs> bit of that going on. Um, as I say, I really enjoyed the last 25 minutes where we went into two different points of view. I found the first half hour of the film very tedious, particularly on a second watch. Um, but I, I, I still think it stands head and shoulders above a lot of the stuff that, that was out around this time. Um, so I'd probably give it a seven. So it's not too harsh. I don't think it's fair. Smokey, that same, what, that's what you gave it, wasn't it? Same, yeah, yeah. same as me, mate. Yeah. So yeah. yeah so can, can, we, uh, um, no, c- can we just point out the, uh, the the tiny little flaw, which is that uh, with again without spoilers, is uh, if I can, is that I don't know about you lads, but when I'm ill in bed with a catastrophic either injury or illness, we're not quite sure. She had an accident, but she's also ill. Um, Injuries. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um the 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 thing on the top of my list when I'm lying in bed when I'm, you know, death's door, I want my bedroom window open when there's a massive friggin' storm happening outside. Yeah, I, I I thought that. Yeah, it's it's like yeah, yeah, I, I, oh darling, I've just come in. I'll open the window for you. No, please don't do that because it's like a force nine gale outside. Yep. They keep mentioning how strong the storm is, and yet he goes, oh, well, I, I should really leave the window open for you, shouldn't I? It's like, no, no, your central heating is yeah, not that good in 1949. It, yeah, but let's face it, Smokey, nope. um, if it was you in bed, you would need to have the window open, because if you're in your bed for Where's this going, Kev? several days... Think of the then- smell. The, the, you're not going to be able to breathe in that room. It's just going to be fog. Yeah, I, 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 I hate to point this out to you, Kev. We've known each other a long time, but I don't look like she does, so or smell like she does. So you, you, you're safe. You're fine. But no, come on. Yeah, uh, opening a window during a storm. No, I'm sorry. I don't. I like think that. Smokey smells like she does. Three days after she died. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so I just finished my question? piece ben, that was sorry, now interrupted ben. by yes. everyone else. Sorry. Uh, so quick, <laughs> have you got a question, Ben? Yes, Ben, I have got a question, Ben. What would your question be, Ben? <laughs> my question would be, isn't attempted murder also a crime? I think it is. Simon Cherry is far from the only fictional person of faith with a passion for detective work. In fact, throughout all fictional media, radio, audio, literature, film and TV... There are quite literally hundreds of them, from Father Aardvark to Reverend Zigzag. Alright, I've made those two up to illustrate a point, kind of, but the fact remains that there are lots of them. So I've chosen to take a quick look at five fictional religious detectives that have appeared on TV and in film. Before we delve in though, I'll add a disclaimer. I've steered clear of the nuns, as the saying goes. Why? Well, I'm keeping my powder dry for future nuns. Not nuns from the future with chrome habits and laser eyes. No, I mean, it's likely that on-screen nuns will crop up again in one of our later rooms of the House of Hammer, presenting me with an opportunity to wax lyrical about terrific nun-based films through the ages. Nuns on the Run. The singing nun from Airport 1975 that plays the guitar to comfort the kid from the exorcist who's suffering from kidney failure. Those ghost nuns from High Spirits. Actually, maybe not them. They bring me out in a bit of a cold sweat and something of a case of sphenosphobia. That being the word for the fear of nuns. It's also the word for the fear of penguins. Who's afraid of penguins? Idiots, that's who. Anyway, stop distracting me with this nun chat and let's get on with our list. Number one, Cadfile. Starring Derek Jacobi in the title role for 13 episodes across four seasons in the UK on ITV between 1994 and 1998, Brother Cadfile is a Benedictine monk who solves mysteries, typically murders, in 12th century England. And it's his unique arsenal of skills that make him ideally suited to medieval sleuthing. As a conversus, he only entered monastic life in his 40s and had spent time as a soldier and a sailor. As a skilled observer of human nature and a talented herbalist, Abbott's called upon him as a medical examiner, detective, doctor and diplomat. You have to say, he's the total package. The character of Cadfile originally appeared in print, created by Edith Pargetner. There are 20 novels in the series The Cadfile Chronicles, published between 1977 and 1994. In addition to the TV adaptation, several of the novels were adapted for BBC Radio 4 in the 1990s and there was even a touring stage production of one of the novels, The Virgin in the Ice, in 2013. 
Second in our list is Father Dowling from the Father Dowling Mysteries, which was a TV series that first aired for three seasons between 1989 and 1991. The titular father was played by Tom Bosley, or the dad from Happy Days as he was better known to me, or even the sheriff from Murder, She Wrote. Father D had a sidekick in the form of a streetwise nun named Sister Stephanie, or Steve for short. Anyway, she can, and I kid you not, pick locks and hotwire cars amongst other talents. Nuns, is there anything they can't do? And I, I know I said I was steering clear of the nuns, but she gets a mention as she's not the main protagonist. She's merely a supplementary nun. With the series being set in a parish in Chicago, many of the crimes and mysteries are mob-related. And they all have tremendous titles, such as The Fugitive Priest Mystery, The Monkey Business Mystery, and The Joyful Noise Mystery. Father Dowling Investigates also has one of my favourite TV tropes, when the same actor plays an evil sibling of the hero. Here, Tom Bosley also plays Father Dowling's brother, Blaine, a thief and a con artist, in three episodes. My all-time favourite version of this trope is in Knight Rider, when David Hasselhoff played, in addition to Michael Knight, his evil brother, Garth. And you can tell he's evil, because unlike the clean-shaven Michael, Garth has an evil moustache. Third in our list is Father Brown, created by English novelist G.K. Chesterton and the star of 53 short stories, published between 1910 and 1936. So similar is Father Brown to the aforementioned Father Dowling, many assume Father Dowling was actually an Americanized version. However, Father Dowling Investigates was in fact based on a character created by Ralph McKinney in his series of mystery novels, and is entirely different from Father Brown. That's right, an entirely different white, middle-aged, quirky, crime-solving Catholic priest. Father Brown is arguably the best known of all fictional religious detectives, and tales of his exploits have continued to be written even after the original author's death. John Peterson has written a further 44 mysteries solved by Father Brown, and many of the stories have now been adapted into other media, as well as the title character being used in film and televisual plots that are not based on the original books. There have been several radio adaptations, movies and TV series, the most recent of which, the BBC production starring Mark Williams, is still going. Number 4. Friar William of Baskerville He's the fictional Franciscan friar from the 1980 historical mystery novel The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, along with his psychic of sorts, Adso of Melk, a Benedictine novice. I say psychic of sorts as it's Asdor actually recounting the events of the book. And what events are these? Deaths. Thousands of them. Well, at several at least. In an Italian monastery in 1327. And Friar William must use his powers of deduction, humility, and perspicacity, 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 his powers of shrewdness to understand how the deaths are connected. The Name of the Rose is one of the best-selling books ever published, and has been adapted into all sorts of things. Plays, radio dramas, video games, board games, music tracks, an eight-part TV miniseries, and, of course, the 1986 movie The Name of the Rose, with Sean Connery as Friar William, and Christian Slater as Adzo. The film bombed in the United States, but was a massive hit in Europe, where we love our monks, monasteries, poisonings, and Christian Slater. And speaking of Europe, we'll wrap up our list of five with Don Matteo. He's a fictional Catholic priest in a parish of the town of Gubbio, Perugia, and the TV show that bears his name has been a staple of Italian TV station Rai Uno since 2000. Using his charm, positivity, love of people and willingness to be understanding, Don Matteo Bondini, the name's Bondini, Don Matteo Bondini, has a knack for helping his cabinier friend Antonio to solve local crimes, which are frequently murders. And he's quite experienced at it, what with the series having racked up an incredible 255 episodes to date and still going strong. After all those murders, it's amazing there's anyone still alive to commit crime, or indeed have it committed to them. Don Matteo has, since his inception, been played by Italian actor Terence Hill, who is surely the least Italian-sounding Italian actor ever. However, just this year he announced that, at the age of 82 and after 12 seasons spanning three decades, he'll be stepping down from the role. And, in fact, he's taking the character into retirement with him, as according to La Stampa newspaper, the new lead character will be Don Massimo, played by 50-year-old Italian actor Raul Bova. And there's already controversy, as apparently Don Massimo is swapping Don Matteo's trusty bicycle for a motorbike. 
I'm imagining Street Hawk, but Italian. I wonder what the Italian for Street Hawk is. Whoa, it's Il Falco della Strada. Actually, looking down the list, the Brazilian title for Street Hawk is even better. Moto Laser. Anyway, fictional religious detectives. Now you've heard about some of them. <laughs> As Ben had an advantage with his research into crime-busting clergy and a surprisingly deep dive into nuns, he thought he'd spring this on us. Sport the genuine Fictional religious detective So gentlemen, we're here. It's quiz time. Once again, it's a high, it's a pressure cooker environment, frankly. And we're here to play Spot the Genuine Fictional Religious Detective. And by genuine, I mean ones that I haven't made up. <laughs> so um, uh, this is, um, I'll tell you, this is a, it's a monster. We, we've got three rounds, 12 questions. So the, the math, 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 mathematicians amongst you <laughs> will work out that that's four questions each. Um, and the, the points increase as the question goes on because they get harder and harder. So basically, the scenario is this. The fictional detectives uh, of a religious nature are are they're everywhere, and, and they, they we're, we're focused on the literary detectives, so the ones that have been in in print published media. And I'm going to give you two options to begin with, and you have to tell me which is is the one that I've made up or which is the one that is genuine. And then we're going to move to uh, round two, where there is going to be one genuine and two that I've made up, and then uh, round three, where there's one genuine and three that I've made up. And there will be an increasing number of points as we move through the rounds. So we'll try and keep up, but we'll just get straight into it. And the first uh, person to go is Adam. So, Adam, which of these is genuine? (laughs) Which is the one that I've made up? Okay, so here we are. The fictional religious detectives. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. We have Adele, the rabbi's mother, or Clementine, the bishop's sister. Um, Am I saying the fake one or the real one? Sorry. You're saying the one you think is real. Real. Sorry. Adele, the rabbi's sister. Mother, or Clementine, the bishop's sister. I think the real one is Clementine, the bishop's sister. And you'd be wrong. It's Adele, the rabbi's mother, created by Anna King and found in Adele, the rabbi's mother. (laughs) Book one. Okay. So I'll, I'll choke you down for... Oh, no points. Here we go, Smokey. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Isn't the done thing now to argue for 15 minutes about how I was cheated out of that? It's not Smokey's Kev go needs yet. To whisper, Kev needs to whisper over your um, over your answer in order to create that, that, that furore. <laughs> so hold, hold, hold for some of that action later. So anyway, Smokey, uh, speaking of cheating, Smokey, here we are. Are, are you ready? You're ready to go. This is not going to be pretty. I'm no, ready. He's ready. Excuse so, me, we're having a holy so, quiz. Put that finger down. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm ready, Monsignor. Oh, Go for it. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay, so Smokey, question for yes. you. Okay, it's a straight choice. Say, I'm ready, Monsignor is a phrase Smokey has used many times in his life. <laughs> only, only when you've decided to play dress up, Adam. Stop it. <laughs> Go on, Benio. Right. Are, are you ready? Do you understand the rules of the quiz? Yes, I do, mate. Okay, so which is the genuine fictional religious detective? Is it <laughs> is it Ben Baltic or Cold Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> They're carries, oh, wow. aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pot noodle. Um, uh, oh, because you're you, uh, Ben Baltic. Is correct. Oh, ben no Baldwin was created by Fergus Fergus Hume and can be found in the book The Bishop's Secret. That's a point for you, Smokey. You're winning. Now, you, hang sir. on. I think Kev gave him the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, you just can't argue as well as I can. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're not. As, <laughs> Kev, I'm just not as I'm yes. just not as invasive. That's right. Are you ready to go? Are you That's ready? That's actually to? true. Yeah, I'm just going to ignore these two. Sorry, it's, it's going to all be edited out. It's fine. Okay. No, leave it in. So, Kev, um, right, here's... 
Okay. Is it is it Chase Fleet or Race Speedball? <laughs> Chase what? Fleet or Say Race Speedball? Again? <laughs> Chase Fleet. Ch- Chase, F- Chase Fleet or Race Speedball? See, I'm watching your eyes for tells. Um, but you'd be the He's best poker, poker player in the universe because, oh my God. That's um, why his wife hates him. I thought see, the law was that all people in the church had to be named after saints. And I can't think of any saints called Chase or was it Race? Saint Speedball. You're not yeah, familiar I can with remember Saint Desmond. Speedball. Yeah, Saint Speedball. <laughs> yeah, patron saint of trainers. <laughs> Kev, Kev, I'm going to have to rush you. Right, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go for Chase, uh, whatever it was, Chase thing. Fleet? Fleet, yes. Chase Fleet is the right answer, Yay! created by William G. Jennings and found in the books The Sisters of Jezebel and The Eyes of Christ. Mm-hmm. Adam, mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a simple question. Is it Father One or Father Nil? <laughs> How, how are you spelling one? <laughs> is that Gok one? Is it W A N? Or is it, no, is it it's, your husband? It's, it's, no, it's O oh, N no, E. Eh. Okay. Father <laughs> one or Father Nil? Um, I'll go Father Nil. It sounds Irish. It's correct. <laughs> Father hey. Nil was created by Michel Benoit and found in the book The Thirteenth Apostle. And that puts us all on a stunning one point each. Lovely. The okay. excitement. <laughs> oh, this is the best right, I've got to hold it together. Way, about holy priests. <laughs> Smokey, you, you, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't even hit the rich seam of gold, but we're going to get there next, Smokey, with, is it John the Eunuch or the Reverend Mike Tyson? <laughs> <laughs> if any of these are true, I'm buying the book. <laughs> uh. <laughs> It's got to be the Reverend Mike Tyson. It's not. It's John the Eunuch. Ah. <laughs> Are you saying eunuchs can't solve crimes, Smokey? I just, I, I just thought that. I, I, I thought it's Ben. The more ridiculous, the better. But apparently, that nope. was wrong. No, I, I made up the Reverend Mike Tyson. Although I'd, I'd watch that. Yeah. Um, John the John the Eunuch was created by Eric Mayer and Mary Reed, and is found in several books, including One for Sorrow and Nine for the Devil. Wow, fair do. Well, I'd be Here, feeling one Kev- for sorrow if I was a eunuch. Yep. Is it Father Whitwimble or Father Gus Gamble? <laughs> <laughs> These sound like names for Umpa Lumpers. Um, I'll go for Whitwimble. <laughs> no, it's Ooh, Father Gus Gamble. You ah, crazy created fool. Created by Whit Masterson and found in the book The Hunter of Blood. And that concludes round one, where you're all on a point each. I quickly say that um, I would very much like to know about thought process that Ben used to get the alternate wrong names. <laughs> it's it's a gift. It's a gift that I have. It's all I can say. And you're about you're about to see the full, <laughs> full beauty of that gift explode in the next gifts. few rounds. Trust me. Come on, then. In Give fact, us- Adam, it's funny you should say that because as we move to round two, mm. where I, I stress all all the questions are worth two points. <laughs> your your choice is this. <laughs> so again, oh god, genuine fictional religious detective from Monty Egg, Bobby Ham, or Charlie Chips. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hungry right now. I really want pub, pub lunch for some reason. Well, yeah, Sorry. We, we've seen we've seen how you inhale a chicken parma or whatever the hell that thing was. Yeah. Right? Ooh. Oh Schwab, God, that, that was it. Yeah. I pushed that thing up my nose. Sorry, Ben, can I have the options here? Monty what? Sorry. Monty Egg, mm. Bobby Ham, or Charlie Chips? <laughs> and these are priests or men of clock. They're religious fictional detectives. Monty Egg, Bobby Ham, <laughs> Bobby or Charlie Ham Chips. Or Charlie Chips. <laughs> <laughs> like Father Ted's priests. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that one of these is genuine. <laughs> 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 it's like I go, Charlie Chips. Bloody Bobby Ham. is incorrect. No, wait, no, 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 that's not, that's not my guess. Oh, my guess. No, you've said it. No, I'm no, I'm no, I didn't. I was running through yeah, them. I was, I was, oh, he's going full on smoky. No, I was, I was going. I can't believe that if I said Charlie, Monty Egg or Bobby Ham would be some. But my first instinct was Bobby Ham, so I'm going. 
Well, yeah. well, you're still wrong. It's it's Montiego. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> he had two guesses and got it wrong. <laughs> Mon- Monty, uh, I will I will read you the explanation. Monty Egg, or indeed Montague Egg, to give him his full title, <laughs> was did created you, by Did Dorothy. you rechristen him Monty? <laughs> no, no, that's how he's known in the book. <laughs> it's just very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Mon- Montague is his full name. I was going to say, it's was actually cre- Montague Egbert, isn't it? And you just <laughs> no, no, it's, it down. it's, it's Mo- Montague Egg was created by Dorothy L. Sayers and appeared in 11 short stories, oh, six wow. of which are included in Hangman's Holiday and five in In the Teeth of the Evidence. Wow, okay. Right, Smokey, there's a big chance here for you to, to get a lead here. Are you okay. reverend? Are you, are, you, are you reverend? I was saying, are you reverend? <laughs> I, 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 I'm reverend you, to go. You'll see why I uh, that that spurted out of my mouth. Um, <clears throat> but okay, the um, all right, okay, here we are. Brace mm-hmm. yourself. The Reverend Grace Gracely, the Reverend Betsy Blessing, or the Reverend Gail Godspeed. God, all that. do them again, please. Uh, we have the Reverend Grace Gracely, the Reverend Betsy Blessing, or the Reverend Gail Godspeed. Uh, Grace Gracely. Is incorrect. It is the Reverend Betsy Blessing, created by Beth Patillo and found in the books Heavens to Betsy and Earth to Betsy. Oh, that makes sense. Fair enough. Okay, Kev. Earth to Betsy. Kev, it's a, I, I don't want to build it up too much, Kev, but this is a massive chance for you to build an almost inassailable lead. Uh, ready? It's a simple choice, Kev. We have Brother Grind, Sister Crumble, or Father Crush. <laughs> You've been looking at my desktop again, aren't you? <laughs> Your porn Did you say Brother history. Grind? <laughs> brother Grind, Sister Crumble, or Father Crush? Brother Grind is definitely something Kev has put into the porn house. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that is actually on his desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Shortcuts. Um, Sister Crumble. <laughs> Just to get it out of the it's way. It's correct, Kev. Oh, He's done it. Yeah. Sister oh, Crumble. Back. Kev. Well done, Kevin. Sister Crumble was created by Kevin, Karen Kelly Boyce and is found in The Case of the Haunted Chapel, The Case of the Missing Novice, and The Case of the Stolen Rosaries. Kev, at the end of round two, you are leading with three <laughs> points to one point to one point. Well done, So, Kevin. lads, it, it, anyone can still win, technically. Mm-hmm. Adam, this is it. If you want to win, you've got to get this right. Oh, really? Okay, now remember there are... Fo- is this there, the last yes, question? There are four... Ch- there's one, well, that one last, this, this is the last round. You're going to get one more question each. Okay. Okay, Adam. Right. Okay, so there's four possible choices. You've got the Reverend Quintus Arbath. Arbath. The Reverend Sextus Expectus. <laughs> the Reverend Septimus Trelaw. Or the Reverend Octavius Flute. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'll go for the first one. The Reverend Quintus Arbath mm-hmm. is incorrect. It is, in fact, the Reverend Septimus Trelaw, created by Stephen Chance, a.k.a. the Reverend Philip W. Turner, and found in several books, including Septimus and the Mr. Ghost and Septimus and the Stones of Offering. Fair play. So you finished tonight, Adam, on one point. I'm, a, I'm a gracious quit. loser. Well, good. good well done, you. everyone. Good it was you. a good quiz. Definite uh, emphasis on the loser. Smokey, it's you now. See, a, a, gracious, um, a gracious host would have been nice. Yeah, yeah well, I, 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 I'm, I'm saying, not, yeah, I, I promise nothing. Uh, Smokey, he, um, right, here you go, your, your last chance to win. Right, mate. Okay, we've got Bishop Condo, mm-hmm. Archbishop Lodge, Archdeacon Toft, or Cardinal Crib. Ooh. Can I have the game, please? You can. It's Bishop Condo, yep. Archbishop Lodge, yep. Archdeacon Toft. Or Cardinal Crib? Uh, Archdeacon Toft. He's done it. Archdeacon Toft is the right answer, created by Thurman Warriner and found in several books, including Method in His Murder and Ducats in Her Coffin. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. (laughs) Right. So, Kev, no pressure, but Smokey on four points is winning. Do you know what will happen if he actually wins this? We'll never hear the last of it. We'll we'll still be hearing... 11 years and he'll just be going you remember that time or, when I won a quiz or I just might be a gracious winner and just never mention it again you won't you'll just call us Blimey. losers Kev I, I, I wouldn't do that like Ben did <laughs> <laughs> a minute ago 
<laughs> okay, losers. Right, Kev. Here we go. <laughs> so, Kev, are you are you braced? Are yes. you ready? Okay, we have a choice for you. Sister Ursula, Sister Ariel, Brother Sebastian, or Brother Flounder? Brother Flounder? <laughs> He's a, a little mermaid reference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is wow. that your answer, Kev? No, no. Um, well, it, 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 I'm, I'm going to invoke the Popmaster rule in all the other quizzes we have. If you say something out loud, in a, even in a questionable manner, I'm going to say, it, right, that's your answer. But no, carry on. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm going. No, no, sis- no, it's fine. Sister Ursula. Sister, is that your final answer, Kev? Yes. Are you locked in? I'm locked so in. So this is for the victory. If Kev's right, he wins. If he's wrong, Smokey wins. I've blown it. Kev is correct. Yay! Sister Ursula, created well by Anthony Boucher, writing as H.H. Holmes and found well in the done, novels. Kevy. Nine times nine, and possibly my favourite novel title ever, Rocket to the Morgue. <laughs> That's an Iron Maiden album. (laughs) (laughs) Should be. (laughs) So with seven points, Kev knows his fictional religious detectives that are genuine. And there you go. As we say a fond farewell to Simon Cherry, the clergy, and the practice of nunning, we also bid adieu to the 40s and to the lovely village of Cookham Dean on the Thames. Partly due to the dangerous country road that went through it that claimed the life of Don Stannard, but also due to the locals' distaste for all the disruption that Hammer brought their way. This is the end of yet another chapter in the incredibly long story of Hammer films, which we're diligently working our way through. If you'd like to wish us good luck on our decades-long journey, you can contact us on Twitter at HouseHammerPod. On Instagram, that we don't understand, which is again HouseHammerPod. Or if you want to step up your game, you can email us at scream at houseofhammerpodcast.com. Again, thank you for all the wonderful reviews and ratings. It always helps in spreading the love. Normally, this would be where I'd give you a sneak peek at what's coming next. But honestly, I wouldn't want to spoil the surprise. But for now, from me, Adam Roach. From me, Smokey. From me, Ben Tillerson. And ta-ta from me, Kev Moore. Stay well. <laughs>